ברוכים הבאים בשם ישוע המשיח. To the translation of the message from the Torah portion, ראה גדול ישוע, great is ישוע our king. Blessings, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, welcome you all. If I was asked what Torah portion is a summary of uh, all the five books of the Torah, I may say that maybe this one, Re'eh. There is uh, so much richness and different, very important subjects like uh, the animals that are food or the feast. In this Torah portion, very similar to the previous one, we can see again all the loving kindness of our master as he is uh, teaching us how to love perfectly and how to keep his commandments. Thanks to the Lord, because uh, Moshe wrote it down, these precious chapters to give us life and understanding and wisdom to Yeshua, all the kavod. Welcome, brothers and sisters. Shalom Aleichem. Parasha Re'e. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Anochi noten lifnechem hayom v'racha v'klala. This is how it is in Hebrew. Re'e is the name of the portion that begins in Deuteronomy 11, verse 26 through chapter 16, verse 17. Welcome, brethren, beruchim havayim. Blessed are those that come in the name of Yeshua. I bless you. And I gather with you in the powerful name of Yeshua, our beloved Messiah, and we give him, the King of Kings, the welcome, our rabbi, our teacher, to this gathering. And we know that you are here with us, Yeshua, and we ask you for the shalom for Yerushalayim, for Israel, and for all Israel, that your shalom be manifested and be poured out over Yerushalayim, the true shalom that only the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Yeshua Mashiach, can bring. Protect your people, bless Israel, bless your whole of Israel, all of Yerushalayim that is yours, that is dispersed throughout the nations, and bless us in this gathering that we might have have a rich time in your presence, in your love, that this might be the hour that we are going to be with you as a thousand hours as it is promised in your psalm. One day in your courts is like a thousand outside of them. May this be a rich time that we might be restored, that we might be healed, and we might be delivered by the truth that you would instruct us that we would connect the more so that we might get to know you more and that you might show us what is in your heart that you might place your thoughts in us and that you would place your heart in us Yeshua that we might walk seeking your face seeking your will in at all times thank you for each and every one of the blessings that we receive by you thank you Yeshua for providing for being faithful and true for giving us healing, deliverance by the power of your name, by your love and your sacrifice, Yeshua. Thank you because you will be exalted in the whole earth, that it is filled with your kavod, with your glory, for only you are holy. Kadosh, 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 Yeshua sevaot, milo kol haaretz tehilato. The earth is filled with your glory. We give you thanks for hearing this prayer. Guide us and allow us to enjoy this wonderful book of Deuteronomy, Yeshua, that you gave to us through your servant Moshe, teaches new things, and we give you thanks ahead of time for doing so. And we ask you again for provision, for the blessing, for the healing, for the salvation of all of those who call upon you and call upon your name, all of your disciples who ask for and call upon the blessings and the mercies that a miracle might arrive to their lives, that you would give over this miracle and you would bless all your disciples with your powerful hand. And not only can you do it, you want to do it. And we praise you and we thank you for doing so. Thank you, Yeshua. Keep us in unity. All of us who gather to listen and to read your Torah, unite us, gather us in your love. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Thank you, Yeshua. Welcome, brethren. I say again, this portion is much beautiful, as the book of Deuteronomy is one of the most beautiful books. Well, the whole of the Torah is beautiful, but this book is especially by the form and the way that it has been written, for this is, as I had said previously, 
as a summary in the form that we are reading it. There are commandments that were not mentioned previously. There are commandments that they are being repeated, and we will receive more understanding concerning some of the commandments that have been previously said through the mercy of Yeshua. And I read verse 26 again. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Et the blessing, if you obey unto the commandments of Yehu, your Elohim, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not, you do listen unto the commandments of Yehu, your Elohim, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after God's other which not you have known and it shall be when has brought you yehu your elohim into the land which you go there to possess that you shall put et the blessing on the mount gerizim and et the curse on the mount ebal not they on the other side of the yarden toward the way setting the sun in the land of the canaanite dwelling in the plain opposite gilgal beside the oaks of more Verse 31, for you will cross over at the Yarden and go in to possess at the land which Yehu your Elohim is giving you and you will possess it and dwell in it. Therefore Elohim is placing before us the blessing and the curse and he encourages us to choose the blessing. When we speak that the Lord is powerful and controls all things, this is true, but he has also given us the option to obey or disobey and has manifested clearly that his will is for us to obey. Blessing or curse, it is that he wants us to be blessed, but in order for us to walk in the will of the Lord, we must obey him. And this is what he's requiring of us. I would even say to demand, but I would more say he is supplicating with us or more clearly pleading with us because he does not want to curse his people, but he wants to bless it. So it's not about remaining unmovable and waiting for the Almighty to do His will. And if we do His will, we are blessed. And if we do not do His will, we are cursed. No, the Lord is placing before every person two options, blessing and curse. And He says, if we don't listen to the commandments, we're going to have curse. But if we listen, we're going to have blessing. Can this be any clearer? Verse 32. And you shall be careful to observe at all the statues and at the judgments which I set before you today. When the Lord says today, he refers to this time. He's not referring just the lines of the Torah which Moshe was writing on that day. He uses it a lot throughout the Torah. Chapter 12. These are the statues and the judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which is giving Yehu Elohim of your fathers you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. Utterly you shall destroy at all the places where serve there the nations which you shall dispossess at their gods on the mountains high and on the hills and under every tree green. And you shall destroy at their altars and break at their pillars and their wooden images burn with fire and their carved images of their gods you shall cut down and destroy at their names from the place. And we had previously spoken about this commandment before that the moment where the children of Israel enter into the land, they must destroy all the idols and all the gods and all the images and the statues. This is a commandment for the children of Israel, and this commandment is valid today. Let's not think that it is not. The moment that the Lord gives us back the land, we must destroy the idols that we find on the way. We understand under the direction of the Ruach HaKodesh. And then continuing on verse 4. Not you shall worship such Yehu your Elohim. For but unto the place where chooses Yehu your Elohim out of all your tribes to establish at his name there as his dwelling place, you shall seek and go there. So the Lord prohibits us from making statues and images of him. In verse 4, you shall not make like so to your Elohim. And he says that in the place where we will worship him is the place where he chooses to place his name, to place 
Aleph Tav, his name there. And therefore the Lord will establish a place in that land where he will place his name. And therefore later on will be established and settled that it is Yerushalayim where he will set the name, his name. And there the King David will have the desire to construct and build a house unto the Lord. Verse 6, And you shall take there your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and et your tithes and et the heave offerings of your hand and your vowed offerings and your freewill offerings in the firstborn of your herds and your flocks. And you shall eat there before Yehu your Elohim and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households, in which has blessed you, Yehu, your Elohim. Remember of the sacrifices, part of the sacrifice goes to the priest, and another part returns to the person who is making the sacrifice. And what it seems to be that in this, there was like a feast and a banquet. When the person would take the animal for the sacrifice, he would gather his friends, his family, and present the sacrifice and take it to the temple. And he would bring it back to his home to eat with his friends and his family. And therefore, there was the instruction that everyone had to be pure of those who would take of the sacrifice. Therefore, the person, when he would invite someone, oh, I was going to make a a sacrifice the person had to purify themselves in order to partake of the sacrifice as the Torah requires hallelujah think about it it looks a little bit like the instruction of Pesach the Passover lamb it must be eaten being pure and then later on Christianity kind of deformed it by saying that it had to be with a right heart which is the same as purity for when the person is pure they don't have wicked sentiments or emotions for the demons are the ones that produce in a person hate and all those types of things so the instruction is a very old instruction to be pure in order to eat the Passover lamb and the sacrifices that are given over at the altar. Another thing that I would like to add is in the previous word in verse 7, your Elohim, in Hebrew, it is common that one word can be made up of two or three words. And in this place where we say your Elohim, your Elohim, my Elohim, our Elohim, the, in reality, the word Elohim is not written out completely, but instead it is a combination of two words, a combination compound word. In order to say your Elohim, you say Elohecha. The word Elohim is not written out completely. The last letter is taken out and the suffix you is added. It is understood that it is your God or in this case your Elohim and this is or the Elohim of yours and this is how I translate it because this is the manner in which it gives honor to our Elohim. But you could say your El which sounds very rough when we use the word in the singular but it would sound very dry and we're talking of the Elohim that created the heavens and the earth and there is no one like he and there is no other God that it is called by his name and this as a side note continuing in verse 8 not you shall do at all as we are doing here today man every doing whatever right in his own eyes for not you have come as yet to the rest and the inheritance which Yehu your Elohim is giving you. But you cross over at the Yarden and dwell in the land which Yehu your Elohim, in Hebrew it is Elohechem. It's the same case. The word Elohim is not complete for it is a compound word of two words. It is a contracted word. In the land which your Elohim is giving to inherit you. And he gives rest you from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety. Then there will be the place where chooses Yehu your Elohim in to dwell his name. There, there you shall bring at all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your heave offerings of your hand and all your choice offerings which you vow to Yehu. Pay attention that the children of Israel have to await many years, many, many years before the temple was established in Jerusalem in order to take the sacrifices. It is not known to me how long before they were able to take the sacrifices from where the tabernacle was standing after they crossed the Jordan River. And one of the reasons why the King David was was desiring to build up this temple 
the house of the Lord was because the tabernacle was unusable because of all the time that had passed. But there could have been other reasons the Lord reveal it. So the Lord says that the tithes are brought to this house, to Jerusalem, And then we ask ourselves, well, the house is no longer there. What can we do? Yeshua poured over his blood for us and we are in a new covenant. And the commandments of the Torah have not been annulled and made void. But due to the fact that the house of the Lord is no longer there at this moment in Jerusalem, except for in our hearts, it does not mean that the tithes and the offerings no longer belong to the Lord. They continue to belong to him. But because now in our day, we have a relationship with our Elohim because he dwells in us and he has given over to us his Ruach HaKodesh. Therefore, we're able to understand from him what we can do with our tithes and our offerings. They continue to belong to him. Only our job is to submit to him. Remember that the tithes do not belong to a religious system, but to the Lord. And when the Lord tells you to bless someone that is in the religious system, obey him. But if it's not like so, obey him as well. The offerings belong to him and he decides what to do with these. And it is worth to mention a little more about about the tithe. Again, the Lord is merciful and we must understand through the Torah and through his Ruach and see that the tithe belongs to him, but that the Lord is merciful with the tithe. How can I explain this better? For example, if you only have one shekel and one liter of milk is worth one shekel and you have in your home your family that is awaiting for you and you say, I need to take the 10% and I will have only 90 cents of the shekel because I have to pay the tithe. But that will not allow me to buy that liter of milk that I need for providing for my family. Not only do you not pay the tithe in this situation, but if you take out of that shekel that you have the part of the tithe and you give it over instead of taking it to your home, you are not understanding what the Lord is teaching us. For he is love and mercy. Can you understand it? You need unity in a relationship with him in order to understand what he is saying. And there are certain things that he will not tell us because he wants us to understand that he wants to bless us because he has care for his children and he wants to give them the best. Again, perhaps the example is not a formula for the formula is really to follow him. But this is the heart of the Lord to bless and be merciful. Verse 12, and you shall rejoice before Yehu your Elohim, you and your sons and your daughters and your male and maidservants and the Levite who within your gates, since no, he has portions nor inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but for but in the place which chooses Yehu in one of your tribes there and you shall offer your burnt offerings and there you shall do all that I command you. The tribe that was chosen was Yehuda, and in the place was in Yerushalayim and Yerushalayim is in Yehuda. But interestingly the place where the Lord chooses to place his name is within the limits of Yehuda and Binyamin including the limit it crosses through Mount Moriah, where the temple will be crossed. Interesting. Verse 15. However, whatever desire your hearts, you may slaughter and eat meat according to the blessing of Yehu your Elohim, which he has given you within all your gates. The unclean and the clean may eat of it, of the gazelle and alike the deer. Only the blood that you shall eat on the earth and you shall pour it like water. Therefore, the Lord is saying that you are able to eat animals and that the pure and the impure may be able to eat it, but not when it is specifically a sacrifice. But it must be done with the condition that the blood is poured out like water. And this comes from the covenant that made Elohim with all of humanity through Noah after the flood, where the Lord orders man to not eat with blood, but pour it out on the earth. Verse 17, not you must eat within your gates the tithe of your grain, of your new wine and your oil and of the firstborn of your herd, 
or your flock or of any of your offerings which you vow and of your free will offerings or of the heave offerings of your hand for but before yehu your elohim you must eat them in the place which chooses yehu your elohim in you and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the levite who within your gates and you shall rejoice before yehu your elohim in all to which you put your hands therefore what is tithe and offering it must be brought to jerusalem and in Jerusalem, eat of it after you present it before the temple. Do you remember? One part goes for the priest, and the other one returns to the person. Therefore, the Lord is saying that you are able to eat all these animals, but the firstborn of your cattle, it is not possible to eat them in the city where you live if you don't live in Jerusalem. But they must be brought to Jerusalem. Now, the service of the temple is no longer there. What happens with the firstborn of your cattle? The firstborn of the cattle continues to belong to Elohim. Therefore, we must have this in prayer. And if you have cattle, I don't think there are too many who listen to this message who have cattle. But if you have cattle, you must place it in the hands of the Lord and the Lord will tell you what you must do with the firstborn of your cattle. Verse 19, take heed to yourself that you do not forsake at the Levite as long as you live in your land. When enlarges Yahu your Elohim at your border as he has promised you, and you say, Let me eat meat, because you long to eat meat, all the desires of your heart you may eat meat. It is possible to have meat. The Lord is not prohibiting to eat meat, but only to be careful to pour out the blood on the earth. And why does it say to take heed to not forget the Levite? Is this particular commandment not valid today? Well, it is valid. The children of Israel have been dispersed throughout all the nations and the tithes continue to belong to the Lord and now his people are a tabernacle for his spirit and he places his Holy Spirit his Ruach HaKodesh in us and thus directs us to those who are of the descendants of the Levites, to those who he wants to bless. Therefore, this is why I say to you that the case of the tithe to this day continues to be valid and the Levites must receive the tithe. You have no way of knowing who is a Levite save in a supernatural manner. But it is not important to know who is a Levite, but to whom Elohim himself wants for you to give over the tithe that belongs to Elohim. Always praying, awaiting, and setting apart the tithe that the Lord will manifest clearly. Verse 21. If it's too far from you the place where chooses Yehu, your Elohim, to put his name there, then you may slaughter from your herd and from your flock which has given Yehu you just as I have commanded you, and you may eat it within your gates all the desires of your soul. Indeed, just as are eaten at the gazelle and at the deer, so you may eat them, the impure and the pure alike may eat them, only be sure not that you do eat the blood, for the blood is the soul, and not you may eat the soul with the meat. This has been translated as life in diverse tongues and languages, but the word is not life, but nephesh, which is soul. We are now in this time of restoration, and the Lord said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And with this revelation, we give thanks to Yeshua for the freedom that he gives us to understand that the blood is the soul. And when we pour out the blood on the earth, then the soul leaves the animal and we're able to eat the meat by itself. Of course, of those animals that are food. Continuing in the next verse. 24. Not you shall eat it on the earth, you shall pour it like water. And it's specifically speaking of the blood. Not you shall eat it, that it may go well with you and your children after you when you do right in the sight of Yehu. Do you see how many times the Lord throughout the Torah repeats that we are not to eat the blood? Later on, the children of Israel, and at some point, are found eaten with the blood and this is a severe and grave sin this is not a simple sin in fact it is so grave that the chronicle of acts of the first believers do not dare to change this commandment even they teach that you cannot eat with the blood and this is shown in acts 15 
Yeshua did not come to change the Torah. He came to fulfill it and confirm it. Verse 26. Only the holy things which have you and your vowed offerings, you shall take and go to the place which chooses Yehu, and you shall offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood, on the altar of Yehu, your Elohim, and the blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on the altar of Yehu, your Elohim, and the meat you shall eat. Observe and obey at all the words these which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after after you forever when you do good and right in the sight of Yehu your Elohim. When Katzav Yehu your Elohim et the nations which you go there to dispossess from before you, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, that you do not inquire after their God, saying, how did serve nations these et their gods? And will do likewise also I. Not you shall do so. In that way, Yehu your Elohim, for every abomination to Yehu which he hates, they have done to their gods. For even et their sons and et daughters they burn in the fire to their gods. Sadly, after the children of Israel cross the Jordan, they fall into sin. In fact, Moshe will prophesy it later on. And they will worship the gods of the pagan people and they even pass their children over fire and they even get to that point it is almost incomprehensible brethren but see how incomprehensible is the case of abortion today just in Israel, the statistics speak of 40,000 abortions per year. I want me to give you another example. In Chile, where abortion was illegal, there's an approximate of 140,000 abortions a year, of which 40,000 are documented. They come for some kind of case or complication to the public health services and it is an atrocity and it's very bad. How do we understand that the children of Israel would place their children in the fire? Well, it is a sacrifice that they make. Just as the abortion is a sacrifice, you give over a life in order to have prosperity, success, a career in order to finish your studies, to be able to enjoy life before you get married. In some cases, it is a sacrifice. You sacrifice the child with this intention to which God is it sacrifice. It is easily to the God of riches or even this God God to which these children were being sacrificed to, which I prefer not to mention. Therefore, many things that seem illogical, that seem to have no sense, people continue to repeat. If we think about how people can bow before statues and worship them, we can say, well, how can they do it? I don't understand it. But when you think about it, it's not so far where you are or where I am. You will find a place where there will be people who that bow before statues of men or women, which are not men or women. They cannot speak. They cannot breathe. They cannot walk. How could people do it in the past? How did the children of Israel do it after they entered into the land? and how were they able to go and worship these gods? Well, it's the same that is happening today. And the problem is the same children of Israel that were dispersed throughout the earth and the nations, and these are we. Do not think that you have nothing to do with Israel. If you hear this recording for the first time, you need to come to understand that it is the same children of Israel that are doing exactly the same thing. But if you want me to raise your heart up and and to encourage you, I tell you, there exists, there remains a remnant of Israel. And it has always been there, a faithful remnant that keeps his commandments. And to these the Lord is speaking to so they can come fully into his paths and that they no longer perish for lack of knowledge. Can you see it, beloved brethren? Praise be the name of the Lord. The Lord bless his remnant that is throughout the nations, throughout the whole world, that is here in Israel as well, and that none would be lost of his remnant. And we pray that all the house of Israel and all the Gentiles would turn from their wicked ways towards the Lord, towards his Torah, towards keeping his commandments. Hallelujah. Verse 32 of chapter 12 says, At whatever what thing or word I command you, be careful to observe it, and you shall not add to it, nor 
take away from it. What is beautiful of this verse is that it begins with Aleph Tav. Aleph Tav is saying all the word, all the thing that I command to you, you will keep. Aleph Tav, you will keep. Yeshua is the Davar. He is the Torah, which is why he's saying that we must keep Aleph Tav, that we must keep the Torah and do not add and do not take away from it. Let us keep the Aleph Tav. Let us keep the Torah. Let us keep it and do not add to it or take away from it. This is a unique commandment. This commandment is not in philosophies or doctrines of men or in theologies. What is most special of the book of the Torah is that if you add to the Torah, you're no longer keeping it. And if you take away from the Torah, you're not keeping it. For one of the commandments of the Torah is to keep it without adding or taking away from it. And this is why we can say that the one who added to the Torah that he's not keeping it. And we have also seen examples where they have added not a little, but some religions have added so much to the Torah that what you are keeping is not Torah at all, even though some of the commandments are being kept. And with this, they are able to receive some of the blessings that come with those commandments for the Torah itself speaks that they are blessing and curses that come. The blessings for keeping the commandments and the curses for not keeping the commandments. And therefore, because there are commandments that bring more blessing than others, there are some people that are more blessed than others. Let us place the parallel between the commandments that are kept and the Torah in Israel and other Christian countries that also keep the commandments of the Lord. And we're able to see clearly which of the commandments are more important than others. For example, the Torah says, I will bless them that bless you and I will curse them that curse you. What country has kept that commandment? Well, United States has kept it for many and a long time. And we can see that this is a very important commandment in the Torah to bless the children of Israel. And also we're able to see the countries that keep very few commandments of the Torah and and we can see that they have not been blessed. And in this case, I do not want to place any examples. Chapter 13. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder and comes to pass a sign or the wonder of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after God's other which not you have known, and let us serve them. Not you shall listen to the words of prophet that or to dreamer of dreams that for is testing Yehu your Elohim, you to know whether you love et Yehu your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. After Yehu your Elohim you shall walk and him fear and at his commandments keep and his voice obey and him you shall serve and to him hold fast. But the prophet that or dreamer of dreams that shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn away from Yehu your Elohim who brought you of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which commanded you Yehu your Elohim to walk in so you shall put away the evil from your midst. So the Lord is speaking of when a prophet speaks a word that said will come to pass and it comes to pass and he says to go after other gods. This is a sign that when a prophet speaks this sign is not enough to follow the prophet. In other words not all that is supernatural comes from the Lord. The Lord is giving us a warning including that if there is a supernatural natural sign that comes to pass and someone comes to incite us to leave from keeping the Torah, including in this situation, we're not going to stop keeping it. Verse 6, if entices you your brother, the son of your mother, or your son or daughter, or the wife of your bosom, or your friend, who as your own soul, secretly saying, let us go and serve gods other which not you have known you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which all around you you near to you or far off from you from end of the earth and to the end of the earth not you shall consent to him or listen to him nor shall pity your eye him nor shall you spare him or conceal him but surely you shall kill him your hand shall be against him first to put him to death and to the hand of all the people afterward 
Do you remember one of the instructions of the death penalty is exactly that the person who are the witnesses must begin first to kill the people who committed the sin. But remember, Elohim requires and demands that there should be two to three witnesses first. And now we say, how do we apply this today? The judgment belongs to the Messiah. And we have recognized Yeshua as our Lord and we have converted and become his servants. And therefore, as servants, we can no longer judge in this case and execute this sentence. Therefore, Yeshua, our master, has taken the vengeance, for vengeance belongs to him, and he is the judge of all the earth. Thank you, Lord. Verse 10. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he sought to entice you away from Yehu your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So all Israel shall hear and fear, and not again do such wickedness as this among you. If you hear someone in one of your cities, which Yehu your Elohim gives you to dwell in, saying, Have gone out men, the sons of the worthlessness, from among you, and enticed at the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve gods, other which not you have known. Then you shall inquire and search out and ask diligently and indeed true certain the thing that was committed abomination this among you. Surely you shall strike at the inhabitants of city that with the edge of the sword utterly destroying it and at all that is in it and at its livestock with the edge of the sword and at all its plunder you shall gather into the middle of the street and burn with fire and at the city and at all the plunder completely for Yehu your Elohim and it shall be a heap tell in Hebrew forever not it shall be built again so not shall remain in your hand any of the accursed things so that will turn Yehu from the fearness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you just as swore to your fathers this is a spiritual case when a city begins to have worship to statues and idols the powers and the spiritual principalities are groups of demons and establish themselves in the entire of the city not just in the people but also in the animals and in the things that are in the city do you remember there was when a person is impure and they touch anything like a bed a carpet a, a cloth this also becomes impure idolatry is something demonic and it begins with unclean spirits demonic spirits and the Lord says that in that city you must destroy everything and and kill everything and even the plunder must be placed in the middle of the city and do not rebuild it again for what is happening is simply a spiritual battle and by destroying and setting apart all impurity that has set itself that has taken people to idolatry therefore this is for us to open our eyes to something spiritual when we speak about cities where there is much idolatry and we must be able to understand and how it functions how demons sit themselves up in houses and in woods in statues in clothing and whatever is in the city and as you burn it this becomes purified verse 18 because you have listened to the voice of Yehu your Elohim to keep at all his commandments which I command you today to do right in the eyes of Yehu your Elohim chapter 14 the sons you of Yehu, your Elohim, not you shall cut yourselves, nor shave baldness between your eyes on behalf of the dead. For a people holy you to Yehu, your Elohim, and you has chosen Yehu to be for himself a people, a special treasure above all the peoples who on the face of the earth. There were many customs concerning mourning and the dead, and one of them was to shave or even tear out your hair or your beard because of the mourning, and the Lord prohibits such things to be done. Verse 3, Now you shall eat any detestable thing. These the animals which you may eat, the ox, a sheep of the flock, and the goat, the deer, and the gazelle, and the roe deer, and the wild goat, and the mountain goat, and the antelope, and the mountain sheep, and every animal with cloven hooves, and having split the hoof in two parts that choose the cud among the animals you may eat. The Lord demands two things, that the animal be an animal that chews the cud, and that has a split 
hoof or divided hoof into two parts like the cow. The horse does not have a split hoof. Verse 7, Nevertheless, at this not you shall eat of those that chew the cud or have cloven hooves, the cloven at the camel, and at the hare, and at the rock hyrax, for chew the cud they, but hooves not, do have cloven unclean they for you. And at the swine is, because has cloven hooves it, and yet not the cud chews. Unclean it, it is for you, their flesh not you shall eat, and their dead carcasses or touch. There is something in common with those animals that chew the cud and have a split hoof, which are food. And it is that these animals that are food do not eat anything that's impure, not the ox or the gazelle or the cow or the deer. All these animals that fall under the category that are food do not eat impurities. They don't eat any type of meat, in other words. And what this is revealing is that when this animal eats impure meat, the animal himself becomes impure just as a person. When they eat something impure, they become impure in the same manner the animal. And this is why the Lord in such detail gives us what animals are food. And these animals that the Lord mentions do not eat any impurities. In fact, they only eat vegetables. Can you see it? What this means is that even a cow can become impure. If a cow goes and rolls itself over on an animal that is impure, that is dead, then that cow becomes impure. And this is why the Lord gives us instructions of how to kill the cow in order to eat it and pouring out its blood. And for us who are disciples of Yeshua, it is clear that we must always pray when we sacrifice an animal in order to eat. It. We must always pray for our animals that they might be pure and then they might be a blessing. The Torah itself says that if there was an ox that was violent and that had killed someone, that ox must be killed and you cannot eat it. And there are the cases where the animals that are food can be impure. And if that animal dies of itself, you cannot touch it nor eat it because it is also impure, even though it might be one of those animals that are food. I am not saying that all the animals that do not eat meat are pure, but what I am saying is that of all the animals that are allowed to be eaten because they are food, all of these eat only vegetables. This is what they have in common. Even the horse eats only vegetables, but it does not have a split hoof, and therefore it cannot be eaten. What is most important here is to understand that the impurities are transmitted, as we have learned, to us and to animals according to what they eat. And we give thanks to the Lord for this. Verse 9. At this you may eat of all that in the waters, all that have fins and scales, and you may eat. And whatever not does have fins and scales, not you shall eat impure it for you. And therefore, everything that is in the water, that those that have fins and scales, you may eat. Eat, but that which does not have fins and scales, it is not food. You may not eat it of those that are in the water. Simple enough. Now you might ask yourself, how can it be that a fish can be pure if animals eat impurities? For example, fish might eat mosquitoes. The difference between an animal and a fish is that the fish is underwater. Now, water is exactly what the Lord orders us to use in order to purify ourselves. For example, in the Torah, it says that if a person eats of an animal which died of itself, you must wash your clothing and your flesh and you will be impure until the evening. There is no other instruction that orders us how to purify ourselves if we ate impurity. Why? Because it is prohibited, those things that are not food. But we have the case that helps us to understand that if a person ends up eating from an animal that died of itself, what we now call if of a sickness, we say that if something died on its own, then that animal was most probably sick. A cow, a goat, a lamb, then the manner of purifying ourselves or purifying is water itself. 
Now, generally, in order to purify from impurities, we must use the water and the sacrifice of Yeshua. And the fish, on the other hand, has a different nature, and it is within water, and within water is a place where we go in order to be purified of impurities. And the Lord has defined that the only thing that the fish needs is to have fins and scales in order for it to be food. Now, I go even further and remind you that within the stomach of the fish is impurity and therefore you must pay attention that if you buy things that are in cans, canned goods, for example canned sardines, these are complete sardines and therefore remember that inside of these sardines is a digestive system, there would be unclean things and when they are canned they're no longer submerged in water but they are instead submerged in oil. They're no longer in the water as when they were alive and unless we're the ones that have gone fishing and then we take it we open it and we take out the entire of the digestive system and we wash the fillets on the outside but when you go and buy a fish that has been preserved in some manner be careful that they are fillets that are in the preserves and make sure that you go to a place where the fish they are in dressing or in trimming, make sure that you take the fillets, take them home and wash them in water and proclaim that the meat is pure. Make sure that you do this with any food that is manipulated by people who do not keep Torah. But when we understand in the wisdom of Yeshua, the fish is something different and it has the advantage or this peculiar case that it is underwater, which is exactly what we use in order to purify ourselves. Chapter 14 verse 11, all birds clean you may eat, but this of whom not you shall eat the same, the eagle and the vulture and the buzzard and the red kite and et the falcon and the kite and their kinds and et every raven after its kind and et the daughter of the ostrich and et the short-eared owl and et the seagull and et the hawk after their kinds and et the little owl and et the screech owl and the white owl and the jacked raw and et the carrion vulture and et the the fisher owl and the stork and the heron after its kind and at the hoopoe and the bat. And here they have all the different birds that are not eaten. Now we have a problem here. The first problem we have here is that the names of the animals throughout time has not been preserved. There are some animals here that in Hebrew the word is not exactly known what it means. Yes, we usually can look through a dictionary what is the meaning of the word, for example, but Hayaana, which would be ostrich in today's Hebrew. But would you investigate a lot and you go back and time you start to notice that in the past and it has been in this case but Yana was not an ostrich it was another animal there is a problem with the names and therefore why do I manifest this so that we can understand that it is a spirit that will tell us which animals can be eaten and he will reveal to us in the case of the birds and what I want to tell you and what the spirit is saying what do all have in common this is a list of the animals that cannot be eaten and the list is very long. I can tell you that by centuries the people who have wanted to keep the Torah and without receiving the Messiah or hearing his voice or knowing him they have taken this verse. If the bird does not appear here then it means then the bird can be eaten or the fowl. But the Lord has given us more wisdom than they. He has given us understanding of the animals that can be eaten and we have come to know and understand that what they have in common of those things that are food are are those that eat only vegetables because they're normally not impure because they do not eat meat. For the animals that eat meat, they usually eat mice and serpents, things that are impure. And therefore, it is the same for fowl, for birds. If a bird goes and eats from an impure meat, then they become impure. Remember, beloved brethren, in order to bring to the temple of the bird, it was permitted to bring a turtle dove in Hebrew or a dove. And what do they have in common? The turtle dove and the dove? What they have in common is that they do not eat meat, only vegetables. And therefore, fowl that do not eat meat and do not appear in the list of the foods that can be eaten are appropriate. They are food. Verse 11 says, 
all birds that are pure you may eat. And how is the turtle dove pure? Well, because it eats vegetables, it does not eat impurities. As a side note, it is important to mention that in Israel there are many types of doves, but there is only one type of dove that eats only vegetables. So what do you say about the chicken? They eat impurities. They eat meat. They eat worms. Worms are impure. Therefore, chicken and rooster are not birds that are pure. And if you look at the beak of the chicken or of the rooster, they look a lot like those of eagles. But if you look at duck, for example, the duck does not look like that. And the duck do not eat meat. Although there are some duck that do eat impurities, like slight meat creatures like snail. The bird that does not eat impurity is the goose. Although sometimes man will add meat to the food of the geese. But goose naturally eat only vegetables and therefore would be a pure fowl. May this be a blessing what I tell to you. In verse 12, and it repeats again all birds pure you may eat not you shall eat anything that dies to the alien who within your gates you may give it that he may eat it or you may sell it to a foreigner for a people holy you to Elohim Kadosh to Elohim your Elohim not you shall boil a young goat in milk of its mother. It's important to speak about this commandment. To not boil the goat in the milk of its mother. It was a pagan rite where you would cook the goat inside the mother's milk for one of their gods. And the instruction here is simply that goat cannot be cooked in the mother's milk. That is the instruction. And any other interpretation that goes above and beyond that would come against the Torah itself. For the Torah itself says that it does not allow us to add or take away from it. That is the wonder of the Torah, that it requires us to not take away. It demands that you would not add or take away from it. This is the Torah that was written by Moshe, that it is the Torah of Elohim. And therefore, when the goat is told not to be cooked inside its mother's milk, this is what is commanded. And this is what it is saying. We're not going to do this because we're obedient. Verse 22. Truly you shall tithe at all the increase of your grain that produces the field year by year. And you shall eat before Yehu your Elohim in the place where he chooses to make abide his name there. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil and of your firstborn of your herds and of your flocks that you may learn to fear at Yehu your Elohim all the time. But but if it's too long for you the journey so that not you are able to carry, if it is too far from you the place where chooses Yehu your Elohim to put his name there when has blessed you Yehu your Elohim, then you shall exchange it for money and take the money in your hand and go to the place which chooses Yehu your Elohim in. And you shall spend that money for whatever desires your heart, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever desires your heart. Heart, and you shall eat there before Yehu your Elohim and you shall rejoice you and your household. Pay attention that the instruction to be joyful it is an instruction that is repeated many times. So the case of being happy and rejoicing in his commandments <laughs> beloved brethren as Psalm 126 says, When the Lord returns the captivity of Zion, we shall be like those who had dream, and our mouth will be filled with laughter, and our tongue with praise. Our mouth will be filled with laughter when we laugh, and it comes out, it comes forth, and you can hear it. This is an instruction of the Lord that repeats once and again. Verse 27, And the Levite who within your gates, not you shall forsake, for has no he part nor inheritance with you. At the end of three years you shall bring out at all the tithes of your produce of your year that and store up within your gates. And may come the Levite because has no he portion nor inheritance with you and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who within your gates and eat and be satisfied that may bless you, Yehu your Elohim, in all the work of your hand which you do. You shall not forget the Levite. In today's terms, it is about setting apart the tithes and wait for the Lord to tell you to whom you will give them and you will have success. There is one more revelation that I must add that the days for giving over your tithes and your offerings are the days of the feasts. 
And in those days there is an open window in the heavens so that when you give it over, the heavens are opened and is poured out over you the promise that is given of Malachi and it may come over you and over us. And it is important that they may be dedicated or given over on the day of Shabbat and on the days of the feast. Chapter 15. At the end seven of years you shall grant a release and this the form of the release shall release Release every owner of a loan able who has lent his to his neighbor, not he shall require it, et of his neighbor or et his brother, because it is called release of Yehu. Et of a foreigner you may require it, but to what is owed by et your brother you shall give up your claim. And for not there may be among you poor, for greatly will bless you. Yehu in the land which Yehu your Elohim is giving you an inheritance to possess. Only if carefully you obey the voice of Yehu your Elohim with care to observe at all the commandment this which I command you today. For Yehu your Elohim will bless you just as he promised you and you shall lend to nations many but you not shall borrow and you shall reign over nations many but over you not they shall reign. If there is among you a poor man of one of your brothers within one of your gates in your land which Yehu your Elohim is giving you not you shall harden at your heart nor shut at your hand from your brother poor but wide you shall open at your hand to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need whatever needs he beware unto lest there be a thought in your heart wicked saying is at hand year the seven year of the release and be evil your eye against your brother poor and nothing you give him and he cry out against you to yehu and it become among you sin do you understand brethren and Every seven years there is a forgiveness of debts within the children of Israel. And the Lord warns that if they come before the day, the year of release, if a person needs money and they want to borrow from you, and you must know that you must let him to borrow, even if there's going to be a year and he might not pay it back ever. The Lord is instructing that not everything that is lent is returned. For when the year of release comes it goes and if you do not lend because you think you're going to lose it therefore if the person who's asking you calls unto the lord it will be as a guilt the lord is merciful the Torah is filled with love and it places the poor in a place where he can receive blessings so that there will be no poor. If everyone kept the Torah, there would be no poor in our midst. There would be no lack of bread. Surely you shall give to him and not should be grieved your heart when you give to him because for thing this will bless you, Yehu your Elohim, in all your works and in all to which you put your hand. For never will seize the poor from the land upon. Thus I command you saying why you shall open at your hand to your brother to your poor and to your needy in your land the lord said that he was leaving us the ruach hakodesh to guide us to all truth and to show us the things that are to come if we are sensitive to the ruach if we keep a life of prayer and we submit all our tithes and all our finances and our offerings and anything that is asked to be borrowed to the will of the lord then we're going to fulfill the whole of the torah specifically speaking about give lending or to giving over prayer is essential not all that we give is good but only that which the lord orders us to give for yeshua wants it to be used for the good and sometimes this is used for evil. I have seen it very clearly how drug addicts and alcoholics try to get as much as they can, taking advantage in order to use it for buying drugs, for cigarettes, for alcohol. And this is not good to give it over in this case. But the case is this, that the prayer, the closeness to Yeshua is the only thing that can give us the wisdom in order to do the will of the Lord. When you do a good deed guided by the Ruach 
HaKodesh, this work has redeeming power and produces life, the tree of life. But if it is not under the order and instruction of Yeshua, then it produces death. It could be a good deed, but it will produce death. It is not hard to imagine when it comes to drug addicts or alcoholics for the good deed of giving or lending over money to a drug addict will produce death in most cases. But because of that, we need to be sensitive to the Ruach HaKodesh for what happens when the drug addict is really asking because it has a need. We don't have the wisdom in order to know when we must give and not give, but we do have the will and we have a way to proclaim to submit ourselves to Yeshua in that manner. And we do so. And for that, we need to be close to the master. If we spend time with the master, with the Lord daily, we are going to know and do his will. But if we don't, we're going to go in our mind and many of the good deeds that we might want to do to please the Lord are actually going to sow death because it is good that comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and this tree produces death because this tree cannot produce life and the Lord has come to restore us back to the garden of Eden but before the tree of life which is our Yeshua our master our Lord we must be close to him in order to do his will Verse 12, if it's sold to you, your brother, a Hebrew or a Hebrew woman and serves you six years, then in the year seventh, you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, not you shall let him go away empty handed. Liberally, you shall supply him from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine press. From that which has blessed you with Yehu your Elohim, you shall give to him. And you shall remember that a slave you were in the land of Egypt and redeemed you. Yehu your Elohim upon thus I I command you at this thing today. And it happens that if he says to you, not I will go away from you because he loves you and at your house since he prospers he with you, then you shall take at an all and thrust through his ear and to the door and he shall be your servant forever and to your maidservant you shall do likewise. This is an instruction concerning us. Six years have passed and I like the house of my Lord and I decided I want to remain my master Yeshua I have remained in his house this is that instruction and it shall be to you a servant always this is what we have done we like the house of our master and we decide that we remain and forever we will serve him verse 18 not it shall be hard to you when you send away him free from you for a double he has been worth hired servant and serving you six years and will bless you Yehu your Elohim in all that you do this comes with promise once and again the Lord says you will do this in your eyes and the Lord will bless you you will do like so with the poor and the Lord will bless you verse 19 all the firstborn that come from your herd and from your flocks, males, and you shall sanctify to Yehu your Elohim. No, you shall do work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. Before Yehu your Elohim shall eat it year by year in the place which chooses Yehu, you and your household. But if there in it a defect, lame or blind, any defect serious, not you shall sacrifice it to Yehu your Elohim. Within your gates you may eat it, the impure and the pure alike, as a gazelle or a deer, only at its blood, not you shall eat on the ground, you shall pour it like water. Chapter 16. Observe at the month of the Abib and keep a Passover, Pesach, to Yehu your Elohim, for in the month of the Abib brought you Yehu your Elohim out of Egypt by night. I make a side note that the month of the Abib and is not called Aviv on its own. I had commented in a previous portion, but it is important that Elohim did not place a name to the months. Therefore, you shall sacrifice Pesach, the Passover, to to Yehu your Elohim from the flock and the herd in the place where chooses Yehu to put his name there. No, you shall eat with it leavened bread. Seven days you shall eat with it unleavened bread. 
the bread of affliction, for in haste you came out of the land of Egypt, that you may remember at the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And no shall be seen among you leaven in all your territory, seven for the days, nor shall remain overnight from of the meat which you sacrifice at twilight, the day first until morning. Not you may sacrifice at the Passover within one of your gates which Yehu your Elohim gives you. For but at the place where chooses Yehu your Elohim to make abide his name, there you shall sacrifice at the Passover at the twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall roast and eat in the place which chooses Yehu your Elohim in it, and you shall turn in the morning and go to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, on, on the day seventh there an occasion sacred to Yehu your Elohim. No, you shall do work. Seven weeks you shall count for yourselves, from you begin the sickle to the grain, begin to count seven the weeks and you shall keep the feast of weeks to Yehu your Elohim with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand which you shall give as blessed as you Yehu your Elohim and you shall rejoice before Yehu your Elohim you and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite who within your gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who among you at the place where chooses Yehu your Elohim to abide his name there. This is Yerushalayim. And in Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, you would come with a vow offering, with an offering with the abundance to the Lord. And remember that a slave you were in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe et statues these. The Feast of Tabernacles shall observe you seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press. This is on the seventh month. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who within your gates seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to Yehu your Elohim in the place which chooses Yehu because will bless you Yehu your Elohim in all your produce and in all the work of your hands that you shall surely rejoice hallelujah three times a year shall appear all your males et before Yehu your Elohim in the place which he chooses at the feast of unleavened bread Chag Hamatzot and the feast of the weeks Shavuot and at the feast of tabernacles Sukkot and not shall they appear et before Yehu empty handed every man as he is able according to the blessing of Yehu your Elohim which has given you and with this we finish the portion of the Torah and it has been very rich what we have read it is filled with treasure and we give the glory to Yeshua the Messiah because he has allowed us to advance one more portion. Hallelujah. Blessed is your name. We give you thanks for each and every one of the instructions that you give, for giving us the instruction of obeying you so that we might be blessed. And we give you so many thanks for being faithful to your covenants and for doing mercies to a thousands to those who keep your commandments. We ask you that you instruct us every time and even more of how we are to keep the commandments, Yeshua, in order to be without spot or blemish. We know we have all the grace to do so, and therefore we call upon you that you might teach us on how to do so, and we give you thanks for this, and we give you thanks for every one of my brethren that is listening to this recording. Father, do not stop doing the work in their lives. I bless them in your powerful name. You are the teacher. You are the Elohim. You are the provider. You are our life, Yeshua. Do the work in them and in their relatives and in their families and in the nations where they are and straighten the path that they might return to the land Israel and that you might fulfill the promise that you gave to Abraham that you would give to him and his descendants this land. Thank you, Father, for everything that you give to us. We give you thanks for your love that you give over the wisdom in order to keep your ways. Yeshua, shine your face upon us and augment your presence and live and dwell in our midst. Give us more of your ruach and more of your truth in order to walk in freedom. For if the Son liberates us, we will be truly free. You are the one that liberates us, delivers us, and you truly make us free. And we give you the whole kavod and all the tiferet. 
and we give you thanks for pouring out your precious blood and for forgiving all our faults, all our wickedness, for taking all our embarrassments and for taking all our afflictions, Yeshua, and because you have healed us through your wounds. So many thanks, Yeshua, and we love you so much and we honor you and we give you the glory and we exalt your name for only you are worthy to be praised and we pray this in your powerful name the name of Yeshua the Messiah of Israel amen shalom al Israel peace be over Israel amen and amen